All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for our Lakeland and Watkins virtual discussion on stable coins, CBDCs, and the future of payments. Uh, my name is Steve Wink. I'm a partner in uh, Latham's New York office where I focus on securities and broker dealer regulation and fintech. I'm also a co-chair of our blockchain and crypto group. And if you aren't familiar with uh, Latham and our work in this area, we're a large global law firm and our top ranked fintech group helps clients around the world from major financial institutions to technology companies and startups navigate the business, legal and regulatory issues associated with the disruption of financial services. Uh, digital assets, blockchain, crypto, and payments are major areas of focus for us, so we're excited to be uh, sharing this conversation today with you. And uh, but just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, today's program is expected to run about 75 minutes long, and there will be two separate panels. First, we'll kick off with a panel discussing central bank digital currencies, CBDC, and then we'll move to a discussion on stable coins and payment tokens. And we encourage you throughout to submit questions and to ask a question, uh, you'll notice there's a little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and submit uh, a question. And of course, if you have any technical issues, you can uh, address those that same way and our tech team will respond to you directly. Uh, Finally, if you're an attorney and would like MCLE uh, credit for the program that's being offered, uh, the, you know, the forms will be sent out following the program and we'll provide a number, a code at the end of the program uh, that you'll need to record uh, in order to get credit. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Todd Beauchamp, to get us started. Todd. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so I'm Todd Beauchamp, a uh, partner in the firm's uh, Washington, D.C. office. Um, I, uh, I'm the co-chair of the firm's global uh, fintech group and chair the firm's um, payments and emerging financial services practice. Um, broadly speaking, I'm a regulatory and transactional attorney uh, focused on, on payments and fintech uh, exclusively, uh, working for a pretty broad spectrum of clients, um, doing a, a very broad spectrum of things, but have done an extensive amount of work uh, in the, the digital currency space for, uh, for various, uh, various market participants. Um, and I would like to ask uh, um, our, uh, our panelists to uh, introduce themselves. Um, Daniel, we're fine. Great. Thank you so much, Todd, and great to join all of you uh, virtually today. So my name is Daniel Gorfine. I'm the founder of Gattaca Horizons, which is a boutique fintech advisory firm. I think relevant to this conversation, I'm also one of the co-founders of the Digital Dollar Project. Um, I previously served as Chief Innovation Officer and Director of Lab CFTC at the U.S. Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Uh, I left the agency uh, last summer, so great to join you all. Great, and uh, and our other guest, uh, Lee Schneider. Lee, thank you, Todd. Hi, everybody. I'm Lee Schneider. I've been a financial services and technology lawyer for more than 25 years. I'm currently the general counsel at Block One, which is a blockchain software company. And uh, throughout my career, I've represented all different kinds of financial institutions and technology companies, currencies. I'm working with a couple of uh, efforts right now and really think this is a new and exciting area. So very happy to be here. And especially with Dan. Great. Uh, and then uh, they'll be joined by um, uh, Steve Wink, uh, who you just heard from, uh, and, uh, and Simon Hawkins uh, from Latham. Simon? Hi there. I'm Simon Hawkins. I work in the firm's Hong Kong office and head up the regulatory and fintech departments here. I've uh, been in Hong Kong for around 11 years and work across the full spectrum of uh, incumbent financial inst institutions, emerging companies, and fintechs. Great. Thanks, Simon. Um, so we've got a, a, a pretty interesting discussion ahead. Um, I, I guess uh, very quickly, want to want to set the stage um, a bit. Uh, of course, we're talking about um, central bank digital currencies. What is that? Um, we'll, I mean, we'll get certainly get into more detail, but at a high level, um, you know, really, really a digital form uh, of of existing currency uh, that, that's issued by. Um, the central bank um, and, and you know various models being considered by central banks around the world. Um, 
it's uh, it's spreading wildly. Uh, I mean, we uh, according to a, a recent survey of uh, you know, around 66 central banks um, covering about 75 percent of the world's population. Um, you know, there are roughly 45 uh, in uh, that are that are um, engaged in some level of effort. Um, in this area, whether you know uh, research, um, experimentation, pilot, etc., um, and and over a third at, at that point, I'm sure it's it's probably um, you know, every every day something becomes dated. Uh, but at, at the time of the survey, over a third said it was possible that they would issue some form of retail um, central bank digital currency uh, in the medium term roughly uh you know next five years um and uh and i think this this um this wave just just keeps spreading um and in, in a way that's 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 fascinating and exciting um i think one one of the uh one of the more notable examples out of the market uh is is from china uh where the it's the uh digital currency electronic payment uh it's, which is their form uh and that's actually nearing launch we're going to hear more about that later um, and, uh, and so maybe we'll talk for a second about forms, uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll get into greater detail on this, um, through the panel, but various forms, uh, you've got retail, uh, where you know, a central bank, uh, could be issuing, um, you know, directly, uh, for use by individuals, um, which, which is sort of a departure from the typical, uh, position and role of the central bank, um, where where uh, individuals you know typically don't interact directly with the central bank, um, and you could have another another model which is more wholesale, where uh, the central bank is is putting um, the the digital currency out uh, through um, banks and, uh, um, and and other you know non bank financial institutions, perhaps um, even money transmitters. Um, who could then uh, utilize that, of course, for wholesale payments activity, but then then act as uh, distribution conduits to individuals. Um, and, uh, um, and then you have you know, various other permutations and and, and perspectives. Uh, I think you know, of course, um, blockchain technology continues to be um, a big focus, uh, but it's not required. Um, and 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 certainly central banks are exploring. Um, how uh, you know, various uh, underlying technologies um, with respect to these, um, which of course will impact uh, you know function, uh, et cetera. Um, why, why, why do this now? What 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 is what is driving this focus? Uh, again, we're going to get into that too. Um, but uh, you know, continuing to um, to provide uh, you know secure, faster payments. Uh, in, in, in you know in a more inexpensive way, um, and, uh, and and being able to distribute uh, funds quickly, um, something that that's become a even greater focus um, you know during the the current pandemic, um, and, uh, and and various other drivers, uh, including the emergence of, of uh, you know, private market uh, uh, entrance, um, but uh, but we'll get into all that uh, and more uh, here shortly. Um, so I guess uh, you know. Let's transition to our panelists. Um, Daniel, let's start with you. Um, can you tell us a bit about uh, the Digital Dollar Project um, and you know why why it was launched and, and what uh, what the focus is? Yeah, sure. And I think you've done a nice job of laying out you know some of the different permutations and design choices around CBDC. But just a step back. Um, you know, I mentioned that I was previously the director of Lab CFTC, and over the prior years, um, I've had an opportunity to hear about and learn about just a vast array of different tokenization, crypto, and blockchain-related concepts and projects. And I think that the one thing that you know really dawned on me, at least as I left the agency, is is the idea that you know computers connect directly. I mean, we can connect computers. That's what the internet represents. And I think that. What a lot of those, those buzzwords really represent is that there's better infrastructure that we could deploy and better technology that we could deploy um, to send information about value. So to unpack that for a second, and we all know that you can send an email halfway around the world, which is, contains information, and you can do so very quickly with relatively few intermediaries and at very low cost. Um, what tokenization and I think blockchain represent is that you can do the same thing with information about value and information about unique ownership of value. 
And I think that ultimately those dynamics are going to impact the way we transact all types of financial instruments and assets. So what became clear to me, uh, you know, last end of last summer into the fall is that this is going to touch money as well. And obviously there were some high profile announcements like Libra, um, you know, the, the digital yuan that you mentioned uh, that certainly captured attention and made clear that, yes, if you if you apply this technology to mediums of exchange, there could be some profound implications. Now, former CFTC chairman Chris Giancarlo is a good friend of mine and also uh, very like minded and he's focused a lot of, of energy um, on the need to upgrade general financial infrastructure. So the two of us, uh, you know, sort of having conversations into the fall where we said from a national perspective, it doesn't seem like there's yet this, this kind of national policy or focus on what tokenization might mean for the US dollar in particular. Uh, so in the fall of last year, we published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, which we considered to be a call to action saying, look, this is happening. Even if you're a skeptic, the prudent thing to do here is to understand the implications and ramifications of tokenization of the US dollar. We put that out. We got a lot of really interesting inbound uh, from a broad range of stakeholders, including some of the, uh, the blockchain team at Accenture, which is working on a lot of global CBDC projects. And we then started thinking, well, what can we do from here? I mean, this is a call to action, but how do you actually catalyze action? And that's what drove the launch of the Digital Dollar Project uh, early this year. Um, you know, essentially creating a platform where we can bring diverse stakeholders that represent different elements of the economy. And I think that's so important because when you talk about tokenizing the U.S. dollar, understanding the implications of how that ripples through a domestic and global economy is very challenging. Uh, so we launched this as a not-for-profit effort where we would go through a lot of what you mentioned at the outset, a lot of the design choices and trade-offs you know, try to articulate a vision of what might make the most sense as a champion model for the United States. Um, put some thought behind that. We published a paper just a few weeks ago, a white paper that kind of includes the parameters of our, of our champion model, which I'll, I'll say we can talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but ultimately, look, our goal, it, we recognize that it has to be the government, has to be the Fed that ultimately leads the implementation of a CBDC. I mean, you, you, you need the Fed to mint a tokenized dollar. Our goal is to offer a lot of thoughtful uh, material uh, to policymakers and to the private sector to demonstrate what the private sector is capable of doing and what we've learned thus far from many private initiatives um, so that when the time comes to begin really piloting in a real world sense or even implementing and rolling out a tokenized dollar, we're better prepared to do so. That's great. Um, so Maybe let's talk a little bit about, you know, why this is important uh, and, and benefits. Um, you know, what does this end up looking like? Um, I think, uh, I think you know, that's certainly helpful for, um, uh, you know, folks kind of coming at this um, anew. But, but, uh, but I think also uh, there, there are a lot of different perspectives on it. So it'd be, um, be good to hear yours. Sure. I, I, I mean, in terms of the benefits, I, I'm going to simplify it by just stepping back to where I started. I mean, the idea here is that if there's better technology to, uh, to, to, to impact the way we transact, including transacting in money itself, and we can create a tokenized, a kind of a digital represent, not even, I don't want to say digital representation because it's digital cash akin to a physical bill that's a central bank liability backed by the full faith and credit of the government. If there's a way for us to issue that in a digital world and drive efficiencies, that's going to have tremendous flow through the entire economy. Now you can bucket and categorize particular applications and use cases. You know, first people talk a lot about retail and, you know, retail means a new payment option for individuals. So instead of pulling out your dollar bill, you've got a tokenized dollar bill that you're able to use to transact. You know, merchants and vendors may want to receive that as an alternative uh, uh, source of payment. So you've got a, a retail payments piece tied to that is this idea of access and inclusion. I think one of the really interesting hypotheses that we have is that if the system truly is lower cost to operate in the first place, um, and then maybe I'll save for Lee to get into the programmable nature of, of, of money as well, but if it's truly lower cost, and then the provision of digital wallet services, which I think is what's gonna ultimately power this on the back end for, for retail users, if digital wallet service providers are able to offer that service at lower cost from a technology operations and regulatory perspective, as compared to a traditional bank account, and that's a hypothesis, like if, it, if it's easier to offer, lower cost to offer, 
then it should become more ubiquitous on our smartphones today. I mean, of the underbanked population, according to a Pew survey, 60% of the un or underbanked have smartphones. So if you have a smartphone coming preloaded with potential digital wallet services, it should provide a mechanism to onboard a lot more individuals into our financial system. So you've got this retail piece, there's a wholesale component of this, a lot that ties to markets and to the actual settlement of transactions. We can move it more real time, it could become more efficient. Um, you'd have more market participants with access to the most risk-free form of money uh, by way of the US dollar. And then there's an international aspect of this, including remittances. Now, I, I think on that front, what's fascinating to think through is, again, not this effort as a defensive measure, measure but more as an offensive opportunity. And I actually think this would, in, this would drive increased global dollarization. There could be consequences of that. I mean, there may be smaller countries, emerging markets where the governments are concerned by a mass move into tokenized US dollars, and we need to think through those implications. Um, but anyway, that's just a start. Then there's, again, I mentioned programmability. You know, the idea of what you could, the amount of automation that you could program around a tokenized dollar is substantial. And I, I you know, I, I do think that this is a, ultimately the system of money I view as a public good. And I think there would be an incredible range of private sector development and innovation on top of that infrastructure. The same way as exists today, we've made a design choice and an infrastructure choice around how central bank money is offered and what fills the gaps or is built on top, I think the same thing happens if you tokenize money and kind of raise the bar in terms of infrastructure. Yeah, no, agreed. I think, uh, and, and two, you can, you, can, um, you can imagine just driving a tremendous number of, of efficiencies out of this uh, as, as you're building. Um, but I think you raise a good point, and we'll get into this in a second with Lee, um, you know, on the interoperability point, but um, but I think, you know, one of the big questions among many is, um, yeah, the underbanked population. So you created this thing um, and, and, uh, and, and can use it, uh, but, but how do we, how do we uh, make it so, um, so, you know, the broader population uh, adopts it and uses it? And I guess that, you know, if you kind of think about the traditional sort of retail transactions, um, you have the, uh, the buyers and then you have, you know, the, uh, um, you know, the merchant side, um, among, you know, other, other sort of, uh, dynamics. Um, but anyway, we'll, uh, we'll get into to that later. Um, quickly, um, I wanted to ask about, um, privacy concerns and how do we address those? Um, and I think this is, a, this is a broader question. Um, you know, not, not, uh, certainly not specific to, um, central bank digital currencies. Uh, but I think an interesting one, um, uh, as, uh, you know, as, as, as folks are, are sort of thinking through how to build something like this. Sorry, Todd, are you coming back to me or are you asking uh, Lee that question? Oh, sorry, Dan, yeah, yeah, no, sorry, that's que that question's for you. Yeah, if, okay. uh, if, you had, uh, if you had any thoughts on privacy concerns and how to address sure. Yeah, I mean, look, that's one of the, I think that's one of the most challenging areas. And I think that's where we need to focus a lot of energy is, is figuring out you know, the balance and, and the potential tension between privacy expectations and appropriate law enforcement and BSA AML requirements. Um, you know, I, I think as a threshold question, I'm still trying to wrap my head around whether that's such a spectrum. I mean, I think that there are some technology solutions that people talk about, like zero knowledge proofs that may be able to help us satisfy a, a certain degree of privacy norms and expectations with proper, uh, um, uh, regulatory interests. And so maybe it's not quite as clear of a black and white spectrum as we think it is. Um, but be that as it may, uh, you, you know, I think that's going to be one of the key things that we need to actually sort through. I think that privacy is something that people expect, especially with cash, when you're thinking about smaller retail transactions. So maybe one way to anchor the discussion is to start by saying, okay, if tokenized dollars are akin to physical cash and dollars, maybe we think about how we apply the existing regime to physical cash, does that make sense you know, for, for digital cash, if you will? There are some distinctions. I mean, it's obviously a lot easier to move tokenized money than it is to move you know, suitcases full of cash around the world. So we may need to kind of tailor and temper like where we draw the line. Um, but I do think you know, what will distinguish the United States and a US CBDC from potentially other global efforts is the, is the focus on proper 
privacy norms and expectations. We have Fourth Amendment jurisprudence that maybe we bring to bear on this to figure out, you know, what amount of information should government have access to absent, um, you know, a subpoena. There's obviously there needs to be an application of due process to any of, uh, of, the, of the pulling of that type of information. So I think, I think that's a really, really important conversation and it's probably gonna be one of the most difficult ones to solve. Again, my perspective is start small. If you're gonna pilot this, maybe you think about in the retail context, limiting transaction sizes so that you're able to err more on the uh, privacy side of that spectrum if it is in fact a spectrum. Um, because I do think that that's gonna be a really important element and one that would give the US uh, a competitive advantage against other systems that may look to create far you know, more massive centralized databases, which may be very efficient, but then you're providing substantial access to either a single entity or a few entities to all that payments data and information. And so that, that could end up, uh, I think, being a challenge for, for adoption of those types of models. Agreed. Thanks, Daniel. Um, so, so Lee, turning to you, um, uh, I guess if we could start off with, uh, with talking about your, um, your article. Um, if you could, uh, you know, uh, kind of share, um, you know, share a bit about uh, about what you covered there, and your thoughts. Sure. Thanks, Todd. And uh, I think you and Daniel did a good job of highlighting a whole bunch of the design choices that will be necessary to make in considering how to construct and architect a central bank digital currency, whether it's a digital dollar or any other country. Um, one important thing uh, that comes out of that discussion is that some of these choices are values choices. So privacy as a value, privacy as a, as a quote unquote human right or moral right or something like that, that that's concept is not universally accepted. And so I do think it's very important that there's an open discussion about, about all of these issues. And one of the main points that I made in the article that I wrote was a point around transparency. I think whatever choices are made in terms of design and architecture of a central bank digital currency, of who the primary actors are in the ecosystem around the central bank digital currency, how people get compensated, things like that. I think all of those decisions are important ones in the making but also important ones to be communicated as broadly as possible so that people know what they're in for, or at least if they're interested in knowing it, that they can find out the information about what they're in for by using this digital currency. I think privacy is a perfect example of that, but there's lots of other examples. So for, for instance, you could conceive of a situation where the central bank is one of multiple organizations that's operating the uh, platform on which the CBDC is created. Well, we want to obviously know what the central bank's role is, but we also want to know the roles of the other participants on that platform, especially the operators of that platform. So that's an example of, a, of an important uh, aspect of transparency. Another area that Daniel touched on is, is with regard to retail CBDC. So there's a bunch of different potential ways to accomplish that. Some of them involve direct accounts at the central bank. Others involve continuing the existing banking industry structure. Uh, we want to know, we want to disclose how that's going to work so people have a clear understanding of of the way this incredibly important portion of the economy functions. Um, part, part of the reason I am heavily advocating this transparency is because uh, when I started really focusing on central bank digital currencies last year, I realized that I didn't really understand all of the different ways the current money system works. And so learning that was an important part of how I got to understand central bank digital currencies, how I got to understand some of the different choices that are going to be made for the architecture. And so uh, to my mind, making sure that there's good transparency around this is incredibly important. 
Yeah. And Lee, just jumping in on that, the, um, they certainly understand the, the the desire for transparency, and there's there's certainly a, an ethos in the you know in the crypto world around that, and you know open source architecture and that sort of thing. Um, but you know sovereigns haven't traditionally uh, provided a lot of transparency, as, as you mentioned, it, 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 into the machinery of their monetary policy. And, and, and as you pointed out, there are real issues, you know, in the article is the real issues around national security uh, that, that those, you know, central banks and sovereigns could be very concerned with. So, you know, maybe you could speak a little bit, you know, why might it be a good thing from the perspective of the sovereign central bank uh, to, to actually enable that transparency? Right, and, and it depends. Uh, obviously, the exact elements of the transparency are, are going to be important. What I think is important is around the architecture and design, uh, around the functionality and the way that uh, data and information is going to get used, particularly from a privacy standpoint. Uh, that said, the, a, a central bank digital currency will potentially have implications for monetary policy. And I'm not suggesting that we need more transparency in, in monetary policy. Um, although I've, <laughs> I've read some, uh, some wags recently saying uh, monetary policy appears to be just giving away money whenever we feel like it. <laughs> you know, whether you think that's right or not uh, is irrelevant, but, but Right, monetary policy is decision making that the government does, and the level of transparency there, I think we can have a discussion about. I'm not so focused on that in part because, uh, you know, the, the macroeconomic stuff is not really my area of expertise. But what I've noticed throughout my career, particularly in the financial services arena, is we're constantly pushing for more and more disclosure in that arena. And so there's no reason, to my mind, not to bring a similar level of disclosure to bear on uh, the way the central bank digital currency functions. If we're already requiring it for stocks and bonds and swaps and futures and all, all of these other things, right? We want to make sure that people go into this knowing what they're getting into because we've made a values choice in the U.S., that your financial life is incredibly important and you deserve to have as much information about it as possible. Uh, personally, I don't see a reason why a central bank digital currency, simply because it's a financial instrument that emanates from the government, as opposed to a financial instrument that emanates from the private sector, needs to be significantly different. It certainly makes sense to me. You know, and, and moving on to the interoperability point that was made before, um, you know, wondering, you know, how should the central banks be viewing that? You, 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 there, is, there, is there a risk that, that, that central banks will be concerned about that interoperability potentially infringes on other central banks or other sovereigns? Um, you know, and then there will, you know, does that mean there'll be a, a you know, a race to see who can sort of you know, garner this market share, and, you know, and, and that sort of thing is that that certainly would seem to be a, a concern that that those banks would be looking at. I think that's a really interesting point, Steve. Um, as I think you know, the Financial Stability Board came out with a consultation paper on global stable coins a couple of months ago, uh, and I read that paper with great interest, in part because I'm interested in stable coins but in part because I was interested in what they thought the implications of stable coins would be for uh, fiat money. And one of the, the parts of the, at the end of the, of, the, uh, of the consultation paper, they have 10 recommendations. And I played a little game with myself, which was I thought about those 10 recommendations, not with respect to stable coins, but with respect to fiat money, whether it's digital or physical or existing, right? And you can sort of play some interesting thought experiments about what kinds of interoperability uh, exist right now with respect to fiat money um, and the way that different governments utilize their fiat money 
for governmental aims, for policy aims, uh, in addition to just for monetary aims. Uh, so I, I, I think the interoperability question is fascinating. And by the way, that's just one flavor of interoperability. Another flavor of interoperability, and dovetailing with something Daniel said earlier, is thinking about how we make the transition from the existing system to a CBDC system. Uh, in my view, this is not going to be we flick a switch and all of a sudden everything is digital dollar, right? Or digital pound or digital yen or digital whichever fiat currency you're interested in. To, to my mind, this is going to be a phased approach. So a central bank digital currency platform is going to need to coexist with existing platforms and there's interoperability challenges there as well. And then to my mind, the last feature or the last, uh, the last uh, fact, factor related to interoperability is the programmability of money, which Todd and, and Daniel alluded to. Um, and, and there, it's going to be some interesting questions as well, right? So if, if the digital dollars are programmable, then uh, presumably that means if Lee Schneider is sophisticated enough with his digital dollars, he can program them too. Um, I, I was speaking with some friends the other day, and the example I gave was, you know, I might like to program the digital dollars that my college age uh, uh, children are using so that the digital dollars get spent on books and groceries as opposed to booze and parties. Um, so all, all of that is, is, is possible with programmability. I sort of make light of it, but obviously you can see how programmability could be another tool for repression too. Uh, right, and so we need to be, again, getting back to the transparency issue, we need to be transparent about what the programmability allows uh, and, and how different actors can utilize that programmability. But I do think that in order to get uh, uh, really the full benefits of this, uh, various forms of programmability will need to be uh, built into the money. Great, yeah. thanks, Lee. Back to you, Todd and, uh, and Simon. I was, guys, I was just going to jump in for a quick second, if I could, on that last part. I mean, sure. I think the point on transparency, um, I think it is really important, though, if the, if the Fed or a governmental entity is tokenizing, minting a tokenized dollar or other type of fiat currency, it's not the place of the government to be loading a lot of business logic and, and, and requirements into that money. The point is the token exists and it allows for programmable kind of wrappers around the tokenized money. So maybe there are tools for Lee as a father to say, I want to specify how this money is going to be used. Um, in other situations, you could see it from a, from a capital markets perspective. You know, people might hear real-time settlement. Well, wait a minute, we don't want real-time settlement. I mean, there, there, there are reasons that you want to have kind of periods of time between trades so that you can generally net and, and, and clear them at certain optimal intervals. But this tokenized money gives you the power to program whatever is the most efficient, you know, kind of timing element around settlement. So I think that that's a really important component. And I, Lee, I very much agree. That's where transparency is critical here. I mean, it could be used as a nefarious tool if you have governments that are programming and coding, you know, substantial requirements into money itself, that raises a real slew of, uh, of issues as opposed to giving people the functionality to be able to add that wrapper, so if they were to choose to do so. Yeah, and that dovetails with the privacy point as well, obviously, Daniel, but just to, to jump in on that. Um, one of the things that I worry about from the privacy perspective is that uh, we always say, well, privacy should apply except for national security purposes, privacy should apply except for criminal purposes, a lot of people are now talking about privacy should apply except in public health situations. Uh, and, and these are really important questions that need to be answered. And whether or not money uh, should be the tool
tool with which people's privacy can be cut back, whether it's for valid reasons or not, uh, it, it presents a really interesting question. Um, I think throughout history, if we look back historically, money has, cash has had a, a large degree of privacy. Um, and I, I'm not sure we necessarily want to change that just because we've digitized cash. Right, that's a great point, Lee. Um, well, I guess, uh, I'm trying to keep us to our schedule, um, let's turn to, uh, to Asia. Uh, Simon, um, if you could give us, uh, you know, I guess a little bit of an overview of uh, what's happening in China um, and, and, uh, and, and sort of what you're hearing on that and then, uh, and then any other thoughts, uh, you know, because I know that there's quite a lot of activity uh, all around Asia. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I think given the time, we'll probably only get around to talking about what's going on in China um, with their CBDC. Um, but as you said, there's a number of other interesting uh, uh, developments in Asia, notably in, in Cambodia, Thailand, and Korea has just announced uh, its study as well. Um, but let's focus on China. And I think um, everyone has probably heard of um, the digital currency electronic payment or the DCEP token. So this is the Chinese central bank, the People's Bank of China has been developing the DCEP since 2014. So it's already been under development for quite a few years. And recently it's been reported that live testing is now taking place. Um, and the live testing is actually going to eventually be rolled out to um, four quite large Chinese cities. Um, in different parts of, uh, of the country. And probably to, in total, that will include around close to 50 or 40 million people, I think, will, will be part of the testing. Um, obviously, it's a big development because it's the first national um, CBDC that's, that's actually kind of coming towards a, a full launch. Um, but also it's significant because you know, China's a big country. It's, it has 1.4 billion people. It's already highly technologically savvy with respect to e-payments. They're very much a way of life in, in most of the major urban centers in China. Um, and just to give you an example on WeChat Pay, which is a very popular mobile payments platform in China, there are around 900 million monthly active users. You can compare that to Apple Pay, which has around 127 million um, monthly active users. So we're talking big volumes of people who are using in their daily life, um, you know, e-payments. So when we think from a policy perspective, like why is the, why is the PBAC, the, the, the central bank, developing a digital currency. Um, their reasons are to try and bring down transaction costs, to extend financial services to China's rural areas, so this is a financial inclusion point, and also to increase the efficiency of their monetary policies. Um, now, I think it's important also to remember that China is a closed economy for, for, for many reasons. Um, it has pretty strict currency controls. So what we're talking about here when we talk about the DCEP um, is a, a largely domestic project, uh, at least initially. Um, but obviously China does have a plan um, to gradually liberalize its currency over time. And the DCEP, it, it looks likely to be a tool that would further kind of internationalize the, the currency, the renminbi. So the DCEP is designed to be for small scale, um, high frequency, um, transactions. So essentially, it's supposed to be a substitute for coins and notes that are in circulation rather than things like bank deposits. Um, it's not supposed to completely replace cash. So cash will continue to be issued as, as usual alongside the DCP. Um, and in terms of the structure, it's this uh, token, it's a token based centralized and permissioned distributed ledger structure. And the distribution model is this two tier system um, we sort of touched upon earlier in this session, where essentially the DCEP tokens are issued by the central bank to intermediaries, which are reportedly the four, uh, the big four Chinese banks, the state owned banks, plus China Union Pay, which is a, a bank run association that runs the interbank networks. Um, and then potentially two private enterprises as well, um, like Alipay and Tenpay, which is the, the payment system behind WeChat Pay. Um, so then it's intermediated by this, by this layer of intermediaries who would transfer 
uh, those DCP tokens onto the, their account holders effectively. Um, the PBOC has sought to differentiate uh, this project, the DCP project, from cryptocurrencies, which are essentially outlawed in China. Um, they've gone out of their way to say that this is really centralized legal, legal tender that's backed by the government reserves. Um, uh, so, so essentially, the governance of the DCP is going to be completely state state controlled by um, by the PBOC and backed by all their central bank reserves. Um, what's interesting here, when we think about the sort of interoperability, which we've touched upon, um, is that currently the the ecosystems of Alipay and, and WeChat Pay are non interoperable; they're closed loop private systems, um, but the DCP is essentially could could create this monetary system um, that makes uh, these the, the WeChat Pay and AliPay system and the existing interbank systems um, all uh, interoperable together. Um, and I've said that while the initial functionality of the DCP is is purely domestic initially, I think it's naive for us to assume that that's the end game for the DCA, DCEP, particularly since there is this um, policy of wanting to internationalize over time the renminbi. Um, and, and especially recently with all the, the trade uh, issues that are going on between the US and China, um, it's sort of uh, perhaps even more important than, than ever that they're, they're seeking to sort of internationalize their currency. Um, and I think the, the first step for that would be um, cross-border trade yeah, with sort of regional counterparties with people in the region, uh, non-US sort of persons who are doing business with Chinese counterparties. Um, and this ties in quite nicely with the Chinese government's One Belt, One Road initiative, which is essentially a big trade route um, mirroring the, the old Silk Road. Um, and interestingly, the, the gateway to that One Belt, One Road sort of outside of China is in um, is in the in the Chengdu, uh, which is a, a large city in western China, which is one of the places that where they will be testing the the DCEP. Um, so it's a sort of a, a potentially a sign that that they're testing it there because that would be the the jumping off point for sort of internationalization. Um, however, they have the, the PBOC has acknowledged that um, you know it's not going to be an easy process, uh, and very much it's going to be part of their internationalization policy. And I don't think we can expect to see the DCEP become um, a, you know fully kind of internationalized uh, central bank digital currency in in the sort of near future. The near future, even though it hasn't formally been announced as to the the full rollout date. But the near future will be this this domestic only system. So then, coming to privacy and transparency, I mean, the, from a transparency perspective, um, and in terms of you know, how kind of programmable the DCP will be, we we don't really know. Um, there isn't a huge amount of transparency about how exactly how this will work. Um, and on the privacy and kind of surveillance aspects, I think that's one of the areas where people will be very keen to sort of see how how that works in in China. Um, obviously, unlike cash, which can be stored physically outside of the banking system and is anonymous when it's used for these types of small scale transactions that the DCEP is targeted at, um, the data uh, the, the, those those are sort of anonymous and and you, you don't have access to to those to the data relating to those transactions. Um, but with the DCEP, the data, I think we can assume because of the, the way that the patent applications for the DCP have been filed makes it look like the process is completely end to end controlled by the, the PBOC. So I think we can assume that data uh, will make its way up to the central government. And I think that brings with it all sorts of obviously all sorts of privacy concerns. Um, having said that in China, people don't have the same sort of privacy rights anyway that you'd have elsewhere. And I think already you can assume that the payments they make through electronic systems are already in, in some way, you know, potentially that data could be uh, used by by uh, the central government. Um, one, it does tie in slightly with another system that the, the government's rolling out, which is this um, social credit, uh, social credit system, which is a a sort of reputation system that's being rolled out across China, which is intended to standardize the assessment of businesses um, and individuals' economic and social reputations. Um, and I think all the data that was going to be collected from the DCEP and, and potentially from you know, a range of other sources 
um, could find its way towards um, building into being built into this this social credit system, um, which I think for for sort of privacy advocates is a slightly kind of terrifying prospect potentially. Um, and, and so that's that's really it. Uh, that's a, a very basic overview of the DCP um, project. Um, I think uh, Lee made an interesting point about on the just on the privacy side again about um, how it could be the, how how privacy may be limited in circumstances where there's a big public health um, uh, interest and the, obviously the recent coronavirus impacts you will have seen in China. You know they do these quite um, vigorous sort of lockdowns, um, put people in quarantine, monitor people quite closely. Um, I mean, the in terms of how the DCEP could do that, if you could access all the data from someone's from someone's transactions, um, you could find out exactly where they've been. You could then do all your contact tracing. You know, there's a whole there's a whole series of um, of, of follow-ons from how you could how you could use the data from these types of transactions for um, in the interest of of potentially public health, but at the expense of privacy. Um, that's all I have on the DCEP. Well, that's great, Simon. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, we want to make sure we're, we're continuing to, to sort of roll on to our second panel. Um, uh, so I, I want to thank uh, Daniel and, and Lee. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, and, and, and Simon and Steve, thanks. Uh, I want to turn it over to, uh, to my partner, Doug Yatter, uh, and, uh, and the second panel. Thanks, Todd. Hi, everyone. We're going to switch over group that's on display here, bring panel two up into the limelight. Um, thanks to Todd and Steve and Dan and Lee and, and Simon for a great discussion. Um, so panel two, and there's obviously a good deal of overlap here, but we're going to focus on stable coins and other areas of digital innovation, which moves us from central banks into other parts of the financial system and into the private sector. Uh, my name is Doug Yatter. I'm a partner in Latham's New York office, and I lead the firm's CFTC enforcement and commodities litigation practice, which has had a particular focus on digital assets over the past few years. Um, let's meet our speakers. We have a great panel today. First, our, our guest is Tal Oron, executive director of Good Dollar. Tal's on the screen there. Let me throw it over to Tal to introduce himself before we get to the other members of our panel for introductions as well. So hi guys, uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Doug. Um, so uh, my name is Tal, I'm the executive director of a uh, CSR project uh, for uh, eToro, uh, which is uh, the European's largest social investment network. Uh, Good Dollar uh, aims to build and advance the conversation of uh, global universal basic income. Uh, and the reduction of uh, financial inequality gap uh, that is uh, increasing in the past years. My background uh, is uh, computer science and a bunch of other entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial uh, projects. Excellent. Thank you, Tal. Thanks for joining us today. I want to also introduce three of my partners here at Latham. First, Steve Wink needs no introduction because he just had one. Um, Steve's hanging on from panel one to panel two. Um, say hello again, Steve. Hello. Um, now let me introduce Yvette Valdez. Yvette, partner in the New York office with me. Why don't you introduce yourself and your practice? Hi, my name is Yvette Valdez. I'm a partner in the New York office. Um, I head up the derivatives regulatory and transactional practice here. Um, and work very closely with Doug on, on CFTC matters in the fintech space. We really look to um, the commodities and derivatives regulatory issues that arise when implementing uh, trading platforms and looking at market infrastructure um, and strategizing around the financial regulatory space. Awesome. Thank you, Yvette. And now um, let's introduce Stuart Davis in our London office. Hi everyone, I'm Stuart Davis. I'm a partner in Latham's London office and the financial regulation and fintech practices. And I'm one of the co-chairs of our blockchain and digital assets task force, advising a wide range of clients in the, 
the financial regulatory and digital asset space. All right, thank you, Stuart. So um, very, very briefly to frame our discussion, the world's briefest introduction to stable coins. Um, stable coin is a type of cryptocurrency that's designed with the feature of having low volatility. Uh, that can be done by tying it to an asset or a basket of assets or through other means technologically like algorithmic uh, system. Um, stability of value, stability of exchange can be helpful or indeed even essential to various use cases for digital assets. Um, and as we've all seen, development of stable coins has exploded, particularly in the past several months. Total market cap for stable coins just based on Ethereum, which is most stable coins, is now over $10 billion, which is an all time high up from less than half that uh, at the end of last year. Um, in addition to the ones that are already out there and in use, other large, well-publicized stablecoin projects are in progress and have caught the attention of regulators around the globe, and we'll get into some of that in our discussion. Uh, but let me start now with Tal and Good Dollar. Tal, can you tell us about Good Dollar and how its token economics will work? Sure. sure. So, uh, as I've mentioned, kind of like Good Dollar aim is to advance the conversation of uh, global universal basic income and the reduction of uh, of financial inequality. So, for uh, kind of like participants that don't necessarily know kind of like what UBI is, then UBI is an economical but also kind of like a citizen right philosophy that welfare choices and uh, needs are different for different people. Okay, so it's a tool to uh, reduce poverty and give people kind of the opportunity to plan uh, their lives without the enormous risk, I would say, of the capitalistic system of being left without nothing. So it's a it's a it's a it's a grand it's a grand uh, and big idea. The idea, generally speaking, uh, um, uh, has been adopted on both sides uh, of the political uh, map. Uh, both kind of like left and right, uh, because on the left wing, kind of like it's a tool to reduce poverty and reduce kind of like financial inequality, right? Kind of like the rich becomes richer, the poor becomes poorer, and like we want to minimize that, and that's kind of like the left wing. Uh, on the right wing, kind of like it, it maintains that a smaller government, uh, which offers kind of like uh, fewer uh, services to people, uh, yields better results for customers. It's a way, to kind of like for meeting. Uh, it's a kind of like it's a so UBI kind of like is a way or a meeting point between kind of like capitalism and socialism. Um, capitalism by design uh, increases inequalities. Uh, it puts kind of like extra trust in people that show that uh, you know they can increase value. Uh, Good dollar aims to give people at all levels kind of like a, an equal share uh, of an asset class. Uh, to onboard any person in the world to the global financial system uh, with a new, uh, with kind of like new available tools uh, that are not just developed kind of like by the good, by the Good Order Foundation, but actually kind of like the broader sense uh, of it, which we, I'm sure we'll talk about more. So, uh, Good Dollar proposition is kind of like an investment in a trickle up economy. It uh, uh, creating kind of like consumption. Uh, 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 at the bottom of the wealth pyramid, uh, or increasing that. Uh, so, so I think like good dollar became more relevant uh, to the fight against coronavirus. Uh, whether the kind of like, motivation or kind of like combating poverty, uh, or concerns about kind of like technology, uh, technological unemployment that might not come back, or the need to redefine the meaning of work uh, that is happening. So. Uh, for example, kind of like the, the, the Pope in its Easter address said, kind of like, uh, this may be the time to consider a universal basic wage. Uh, and he's not the, 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 the first one. Uh, Zuckerberg said that, uh, Elon Musk said that, Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King said that. Um, uh, in Spain, for example, uh, uh, it, it became the first country to promise a, a national wide rollout of uh, UBI in many, many other countries. Uh, in the world, such as Australia, Japan, uh, New Zealand, and Germany, uh, are talking about uh, doing uh, uh, some of those same things. So, um, as the previous panel, kind of like I guess, like uh, member uh, mentioned, is that the financial system is very restrictive and concentrated. 
And some even would say that like it's too powerful. And the aim of uh, what we've heard kind of like in the first panel is that the aim of, the, of stable coins is to increase uh, the velocity of, uh, of trade at the end of the day. Uh, so removing barriers, letting kind of like, uh, 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 letting more um, uh, in innovative tools uh, to be developed uh, so we can so we can reduce kind of like friction uh, in the uh, in in between kind of like in between uh, people who uh, trade. So like here's an example, right? Like a migrant worker in Ghana, on their phone can receive universal basic income and put it uh, uh, in an investment uh, based tool in Tel Aviv or invest in the Nasdaq and send their profits as phone minutes to their parents in Kenya. Think about kind of the complexity of today's system in order to do such thing. Uh, uh, and so kind of like, generally speaking, we're talking about kind of like uh, new systems that would increase the likelihood of such a scenario to be done in a super simple way uh, where uh, fraud at the end of the day is limited. Um, does that make sense, Doug? Definitely does. It's a great overview to, of the project. And, and, um, and, I, and I can speak about kind of like the, the, the economic model you've asked. Would you like to do that? Yeah, and I think that's, that's the bridge we should go to next, which is how does, you know, how do crypt, you know, token economics work? How, how, does, how does the mission of, of developing global, scalable, universal basic income interconnect with these ideas about how do you have you know, stable value, exchange rates, interoperability, all those things. Yeah, so, so maybe first kind of like I'll, 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 I'll help kind of like understand kind of like how, how, we're, how we're envisioning kind of like a global universal basic income. So on a, on, a, on a local level, we kind of understand that on a country level, kind of like yeah, a government has taxes, uh, the taxes can be redistributed uh, among its uh, citizens in an equal way so that like we reduce kind of like uh, poverty and reduce uh, 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 the financial wealth gap. How does that work? Why does the UBI kind of like work? So let, let's describe that uh, if you give a dollar to a, to a person who makes a dollar a month, then you've doubled their salary. If you give the same dollar to a billionaire, like you've, you've made no impact on their, on their wealth. So mathematically, kind of like if you give more people at the bottom of the pile, uh, of the of the pyramid, kind of like uh, more money, then you reduce uh, you reduce inequality. The pro uh, pr pr concept such as programmable money gives us the opportunity to to do that. So we champion a no donation, voluntary mechanism to support UBI. Um, again, kind of like as a mean to to allow a faster trickle up economy. So if you're if you believe in the power of uh, uh, injustness of, of trickle up economy, it would support UBI as a system that allows millions of people to get uh, the global economy, uh, to get into the global economy and create kind of like further wealth for themselves and for the supporters of such a vision. So we uh, do that by, or kind of like the main question is kind of like, where does the money come from? That's typically kind of like the, the, the main question uh, because we can envision kind of like people uh, receiving money uh, being able to spend it. Um, so two key stakeholders are the supporters and the, and the claimers of the system. Uh, we offer supporters uh, uh, of UBI to tap into existing interest-bearing protocols known as kind of like DeFi protocols. Um, examples are kind of like MakerDAO and, and, and Compound and Dharma and DMM and many other kind of like newly available uh, services, uh, typically kind of like lending services that, uh, that uh, creates interest. And we keep that interest in a reserve mechanism. We, uh, at the moment, kind of like to, to begin with, we start with a one-to-one, -one, so a one-to-one -one reserve mechanism for the coin. We, for, for every dollar that you support the, the UBI cause, you receive a token back which, rep which represents kind of like that, that, that support. And over time, we reduce it to begin with by 10% uh, uh, annually, kind of like the reserve ratio, so that we can mint more coins or more tokens to, people's, to, to people as UBI. So 
like an example kind of like would be kind of like a $2,000 kind of like uh, if you want to support UBI on a global level kind of like with $2,000 uh, and you put it in a fund that let's say kind of like yields 5% for the sake of the argument here, um, it creates a hundred, the, the system creates automatically kind of like a hundred dollars uh, of uh, uh, reserved annually, five, $2,000, 5%. That same hundred good like that same hundred dollars is being received as good dollars. So like the 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 the, the supporter of the system can can still see kind of like their their core value with them just as a stake of the new future economy. And over time, as the reserve ratio reduces, we can mean more UBI. For example, to the extent of fifty percent ratio, that means that we can create kind of like another hundred dollars for as UBI, so, and we distribute those. So the supporters receive um, um, uh, a, 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 an asset in a future economy, while kind of like people have access to financial assets uh, that are stable and backed by real money. Excellent, so thank you, Tal. We, we could um, spend a lot of time on the mechanics of this, um, but I want to make sure we get in our regulatory experts now. And, and this is this is a great framework for it because this is such a good example of the sort of transformative power of this kind of innovation with digital assets. So um, let me start with Stuart uh, in London. And Stuart, for these kind of for this kind of token innovation, digital asset innovation, um, what's the you know, in a nutshell, what's the UK and EU perspective? on stable coins and other other areas of innovation like this sure thanks doug um i mean broadly there's no comprehensive regulatory regime which surrounds crypto assets let alone you know more advanced stable coins i think regulators over the last couple of years have been struggling to figure out how to plug this new asset class within the scope of their either existing regulatory regimes or potentially to consult on um, adopting new legislative regimes, but in Europe there are essentially five categories of, of of sort of regulation which a project like this may fall within, depending on how it's structured and the rights and obligations which sit behind it, which a holder of the asset receives. Um, so we have the AML KYC regime, which has just recently been updated to include. Um, crypto wallet providers and crypto exchange providers within the scope of the broad European framework. We have the payment services and electronic money regime, which would capture a, a stable coin if the stable coin was structured um, as a digital form of money. Typically, there are exemptions, but um, you'd fall within that regime and you need a license to, to be a service provider in that space. Then you have the regulatory regime applying to financial instruments like securities or derivatives. Again, that requires a license for a, a wide range of activities that you might be carrying out, depending on how you um, structure the stable coin, both the issuer as well as um, the service providers in that space can fall within scope. Um, if the stable coin, for example, was tied to a security or looked like a derivative over an underlying asset, then it, they could fall within scope. Um, the fourth type of regime is the regulated regime surrounding financial market infrastructures like payment systems, because if you're trying to create a global, um, you know, token, which acts as a cross border payment token, then does it fall within the, the concept of a payment system? And does it engender some of the financial stability concerns which sit around that? And the final category is largely unregulated tokens. So, you know, we've seen a number of stable coins structured in a way where the rights and obligations which a uh, holder receives don't amount to one of the other four types of, of categories. Um, what's currently happening in the, in the EU is a general sort of regulatory discussion as to whether regulation currently is suitable. Um, I think the best guidance on the treatment of stable coins under the current regime, which has been released as the FCA's guidance on, on crypto assets, which really makes it clear that each crypto asset, whether it's a stable coin or, or Bitcoin, requires its own case by case assessment of the rights and obligations to determine how it falls within scope. Um, but regulators and legislators are catching up and 
the um, EU Commission has a consultation out currently on potential new regulatory regime for crypto assets, which would include stable coins. And this month, the European Parliament's um, Economic uh, Affairs Committee um, has recommended that the Commission should implement a bespoke um, regulatory regime applicable to, to crypto assets. And it looks like we're going to get that uh, the consultation finalizing um, at the back end of this year. It's obviously subject to, to COVID. Um, the final thing I wanted to mention is um, generally regulators across the EU, but also as I understand it, you know, globally take this approach to regulation and, and legislating for regulation of technology neutrality. So um, it doesn't matter uh, what technology you're using to carry on an activity which is regulated. Um, if you're carrying on that activity, you fall within scope of a licensing requirement or in scope of the relevant regulatory regime. And broadly that's seen as a really flexible way to regulate because it captures new technologies. Um, but I think it's becoming apparent that that conception of tech neutrality is really starting to become frayed at the edges because new technologies and payment methods are not necessarily envisaged within the concept of current regulation. Defining regulation, even on a tech neutral basis, by way of um, definitional activities means that regulators have struggled when a new technology has come along and the activity technically falls outside the scope of the definition. And I think that's what's happened with, with stable coins. So the regulator's response has been in a number of cases to say, well, right, we'll take that initial definition and we'll have a very liberal and expansive view of what falls within scope, envisaging things which might not even fall within scope of the common reading of the language. That is useful from a regulator's perspective because it means that um, <clears throat> you can track in certain projects which they consider should have fallen within the purpose of that legislation. But the expansive view also drags in other projects which were never meant to be considered in scope of regulation. And we've got a lot of regulatory uncertainty, I think, um, in, in Europe at the moment. Um, so the final thing I'd say, I was quite pleased and interested to see in a, a speech in January by the Bank of England, um, Christina Siegel Knowles, that they're arguing for a concept of tech neutrality which seeks to define and apply regulation on the basis of risk. So same risk, same regulation, as opposed to same activity, same regulation. And I think that could be an important way in which regulation can be drafted and defined to create a level playing field so that we're not looking at just how is your project structured, meaning that it should fall within scope, but how is your project impacting the global risk environment um, and risk to consumers. And I think it arguably also provides a more flexible regulatory regime, which can also um, provide more certainty to, to innovative companies. That's how I'd like um, regulation to be drafted, but we've got a long way to go yet. Um, time will tell. Thanks, Stuart. That's a great overview. And, and I hope you're right. And I think voices like yours will help to steer things in that direction. Um, let's use that as a jumping off point to come back over to the U.S. to, to first Steve and then Yvette. Um, you know, the, the Stewart's remarks about the sort of overlapping sets of regulatory priorities and the evolving approach to it obviously resonates over here, though there are some differences. So, so Steve, why don't you tell us when it comes to stable coins and other areas of token innovation, um, you know, is this allowed in the U.S. from a securities perspective and what would the SEC have to say about it? Yeah, obviously here in the U.S. we have, um, you know, this very fractured regulatory system with lots of different regulators that you have to deal with. And of course, in, in all of these sort of token type projects, uh, you have to consider whether under the U.S. securities law, the instrument is a security. I'm sure everyone is now familiar with the Howey test, which essentially says that an investment contract which is a type of security is an investment of money with an expectation of profit from the efforts of others. So as a general matter, the concept of a stable coin is that it remains stable in value. And so there shouldn't be an expectation of profit 
for those purchasers of the stable coin. Um, but then the next question also comes in is like, how is that stability maintained? So a coin peg to the dollar, for example, is an easy one, pretty straightforward, in the sense that there should be no expectation for, for, of profit if you can buy it for a dollar and you can resell it for a dollar, essentially. Um, and the, of course, the purpose or utility of that token is, uh, is its ability to access the network or, or store value. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can, you can only peg a token to fiat or, or even precious metals, for example. There are many things that can act as a peg in this context that, that would create that sort of stability and, and lack of, of, uh, of the profit element. And, you know, even if the underlying value of the peg fluctuates, it shouldn't also impact the analysis here. That is, if you have a gold peg, well, gold fluctuates uh, but it's determined, its value is determined by the broader market, not by one particular enterprise or group of people. So that shouldn't make the token an investment contract in that, that case. Now, where we do get a bit concerned, you know, is, is when we look at, you know, the mechanisms for stabilization. For example, if you have market making or, or, or an algorithmic method that, that's exercised by some sort of central authority on the network. I, be concerned about how that works in practice to ensure there isn't some sort of arbitrage opportunity that uh, purchasers could seek to take advantage of, which could potentially create this expectation of profits. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. So, so that's the securities law perspective. Let's look, you know, to what is sort of the other side of the coin, so to speak, in the US. Yvette, tell us how do we look at these issues around stable coins and other digital innovations from the commodities and derivatives perspective? Sure, so once um, I think we've made a determination if you think you um, satisfied the, the or, or gotten over the hurdle of the securities law test and you don't think that you're really um, dealing with the security, the other element is really, is it a commodity or a commodity interest? And so, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission uh, regulates commodity interest, which many of you know as derivatives um, and other leveraged commodity transactions, and retains enforcement authority to regulate against manipulation and fraud um, for commodity transactions themselves. So you really need to look at, um, it's really a two layer approach is, one, do you have a derivative that is subject to supervisory uh, authority and, and the regulatory framework of the CFTC? And so to consider one of the sort of issues um, that you really do need to look at closely is the CFTC actually has a very broad definition of what a derivative is. It is effectively a financial instrument which derives its value from an underlying asset. And so when we look at these stable coins and we look to where the value of the asset is, is it a pool of securities looking at broad-based indices? Um, are we looking at gold or other commodities? We really have to go through the analysis of whether or not this would be considered a derivative or commodity interest that the CFTC would wanna regulate and subject all the market participants to the regulatory and supervisory authority, which includes registration, and frankly, which is a deal killer in the stablecoin world because it's not really open to, to retailers. You have to be a sophisticated investor to effectively be able to buy and sell this product um, over the counter and not in an exchange. And so some the other aspect of that is, as Steve mentioned, that we look at is, is what are the mechanics for stabilization? And this has become a really important topic because there's various ways that you could actually achieve stabilization. Some of it is, is do, are you relying on uh, market makers and market participants in order to ensure that the stabilization of the um, of the value of the token is following sort of that underlying pool and the underlying value in order to achieve that at market you need to continue to buy and sell in order to kind of get to that margin of, of what that value is of what that stable value is um, 
The other ways that you know we're currently seeing in the market in different structures is a combination of market making and algorithmic um, increase and decrease of supply and demand. And so there are various structures, but it's very important to also look to and consider the commodities analysis in those mechanics of stabilization because the CFTC um, effectively wants to ensure that the commodity spot market is not subject to manipulation and fraud. And so the questions arise as to whether ensuring that a central uh, market maker is ensuring the stabilization, is that potentially creating an artificial price? So there are a lot of issues to walk through from the CFTC enforcement component and purview, but also from the regulatory point of view. And I think it's, it's also important to mention that the SEC and the CFTC are not the only two regulators that you really need to work through in the US when considering stable coins, right? You have um, your AML KYC, but the money service uh, business and the money transmitter licenses across the 50 states to also consider, which would have a similar effect that many of you are, are, are familiar with. Um, back to you, Doug. Excellent. Thank you, Yvette. So we're, we're running up against our end time here, and there's a lot we could say here, but let me, let me pose one question to the group, and we can ask Tal for his views and then others to weigh in before we, before we wrap up. Um, you know, I think uh, it may have been Lee who mentioned it earlier this morning, uh, that there was you know, the Financial Stability Board of the G20 released a consultation paper with some high-level recommendations to promote a multilateral approach to oversight of global stable coins. Um, and I want to focus on one of those recommendations, which was that authorities should not permit the operation of a global stablecoin arrangement in their jurisdiction unless it meets all of the jurisdiction's regulatory, supervisory, and oversight requirements. Tal, as an innovator and a, and a developer in this space, what's your reaction to that view? And then let me throw it to my regulatory colleagues for any final thoughts on how things get built in an environment like this. Um, well, it's a, it's a, it's a complex, uh, it's a complex uh, subject, obviously, and a contentious one, uh, which, uh, 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 needs to kind of question, I guess, like innovation in that context. And, uh, if we look back in time, kind of government didn't make kind of like, uh, you know, Bitcoin or the technology of it, kind of like they were late to the game. Ethereum was kind of like announced money, kind of like before because there's no kind of like there wasn't any regulation like putting uh, ahead kind of like regulation on a, on such a kind of like a, a massive scale like just like Stuart's kind of like mentioned like is 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 problematic uh and it hinders innovation and it hinders company like us to, uh, uh or uh, foundations like us to do so to do so and and and, and move kind of like the needle on a global scale but i think there's 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 actually questions that we really haven't touched a lot uh, is about decentralization versus centralization. So well, we've heard a lot, of, a lot about kind of like uh, uh, companies operating in a jurisdiction and whether you can kind of like restrict that. But what happens kind of like when, when we're talking about kind of like decentralized concepts where uh, 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 bodies from around the world come together uh, to, do, to, do, to, to solve things together? Uh, how are they being judged uh, uh, how how, the, how does the whole project kind of like be, be being judged at? Uh, does it does it need to apply kind of like for a money license in the U.S. and 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 what does that mean kind of like for competition again Master, Mastercard and, and and Visa like if you if you can't kind of like compete with them uh, because you need to spend a lot of money to do so. Um, so I think like the regu like what I love to kind of like to see from the regulator is is actually kind of like a point of view on governance and regulation. So if you look at kind of like at, at, at the role of a regulator, as I perceived, it is about kind of like, it's about uh, consumer safety uh, at the end of the day uh, and stability. So, so I think like when we're coming to decentralized kind of like nature uh, of, of, of uh, money aspects, then I would love to see kind of like regulations around kind of like what should a governance model look like uh, 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 on a distributed on a distributed network. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. 
I think that, um, I mean, to be fair, the FSB is coming at this from financial stability. And there's such a vast sort of vertical library of regulation. Um, and that regulation at the top, which tends to be quite, you know, generic, but very, very important, like don't mess with financial stability. I get that in that context. But when you go down that vertical library to, to the bottom, there are many examples of um, regulated regimes, take the safeguarding regime under PSD2, where certain um, perfectly legitimate cryptocurrency projects cannot comply with regulation as it is today, because it's been drafted with the concept of fiat currency in mind, and not with the concept of an underlying which might be cryptocurrency. So I disagree very respectfully with the, the FSB. I think you need to take a much more case by case approach and regulation needs to be drafted in a way which can accommodate different legitimate, different types of legitimate business. Excellent, great thoughts. Um, Yvette, can we throw it to you for final thoughts and to bring us on home? Yeah, sure. I was just going to say, you know, one of the things and, and to piggyback on what Stuart was saying is, is we traditionally have a model where you have public sector and private sector solutions, right, that ultimately get backed by the public sector because you can ultimately turn it back into fiat, right, this central digital currency. And so I think there is a, a, a world where there's various solutions um, that don't necessarily fit one model, but ultimately um, are, are supported, right, by the central governments. And, and we traditionally in the United States in particular have these competing forces of, and, and they're very political as well, market uh, solutions, but also the administrative state. And we like to ensure that we can kind of implement both at the same time and there's a, typically some conflict there. And so um, with Stuart, I think in the US, we face very similar situations as trying to allow legal innovation while still ensuring you know, financial stability and having an administrate that administrative state that can help control that. So um, you know, I think it's really exciting times. And as we, the regulators continue to collaborate and think through these issues, you know, ultimately the goal is to allow this legal innovation in a safe and resilient sort of way. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Apologies, we went a couple of minutes late. Um, the CLE code for those interested is 299-8027. We will send the appropriate CLE forms in a, in a link and we will also encourage you to sign up for our blog where we have a lot of updates um, in the fintech space in the payment states. It's fintechandpayments.com. Um, but otherwise, thanks very much. We'll be sending you an email. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And thank you to all the panelists, the outside speakers. We very much um, appreciate you joining us today for the conversation. Thank you, Beth. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Everyone has a great day and evening.